I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q&A. Tom, let's go ahead and kick this off. What do we have for questions? Okay. All right. And uh, we have Annie in Australia who sent us some questions. So um, the first one, and it's actually, a, it's a question that I've often had. And um, so uh, something we could probably really delve into and see, if, you know, if we can come up with an answer. But question number one, is it possible to estimate the Sasquatch population number? How is this done? And, um, you know, of course, we can only address that for North America. But, uh, Will, what are your thoughts on that? How do you, I know how the forest, excuse me, how fish and wildlife We'll do it for mountain lions and bears and, you know, all that sort of thing. But how do they do, how do we do it for uh, Sasquatch? Well, I can tell you what I was told, you know, through one of my sources. Um, and it was only, it wasn't a specific number. It was just, uh, they estimated their population in six figures. In the 1950s, when they first started looking at it, they said it was around 50,000 at that time. So... Um, I don't think that's unreasonable if you have, you know, the land mass as big as it is with North America and, um, you know, you have to have a viable pre uh, breeding population. So I, I think between, you know, 50,000 and at that time period, and then upwards of, you know, whatever six figures means, whether it's a hundred thousand or 999,000, I have no idea, but, um, Forrest, what do you think? Well, I don't, <clears throat> you know. I have no idea how you would determine the population. Um, I think personally, and I think you and I have discussed this, uh, I think the population is growing. Um, oh, absolutely. You know, and I think that what we have done is um, we have, you know, provided them with a more stable source of uh, food, whether it be our food crops or whether it be our animals, our pets or whatever which is, uh, you know, you know, primates are very adaptive. And um, so they're going to, they may even be changing their uh, method of uh, survival at this point, you know, rather than going out and having to run down a deer, it's so much easier just to go and coax Fido out into the woods and have Fido for supper. So, and, and, people, um, and people might ask, how do we know those two things? We know, number one, or we believe the population is growing, one, because for many years, for decades, um, with all the sighting reports, it was always adults. There were never or very seldom, extremely seldom mentions of juveniles. In the past few years, mm -hmm. we've gotten lots of juveniles. So that's an indicator That's an indicator of population growth. And the other one about behaviors is we're seeing behavioral changes through all these reported incidents. Yeah, and boy, exactly. I Right, right. Well, and I looked into how the uh, 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 land, not land management, but but the um, fish and wildlife make their estimates. And I think I mean to talk to some of those guys. And uh, you know, they've got software, they have algorithms, and basically, you know, when they say, well, state of Oregon, for example, has uh, sixty six hundred roughly 6,600 mountain lions, okay? And then they have, you know, they take a look at a lot of different factors, you know, food source and reproduction cycles and all that sort of thing and how much land, you know, the mountain lions have. Same thing for black bear. Black bears, I think, was at one point estimated at 35,000. That's a lot of, that's a lot of black bears. So anyway, I would have, not be surprised if that same software could be used by some agency who has an interest and uh, is able to use it to forecast. I, I would suppose it depends on how many are seen in a geographical area over a certain time period and 
you yeah. know, like you said, the food supply, how many would it, you know, how much does that animal eat during whatever time frame? And then, um, you know, how much would that area sustain an individual? And you could probably calculate how many individuals could live in that area over whatever given time. <laughs> how, many, how many people have vanished in that area over a given period of time? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we know that. Um yeah. No so anyway, kidding. Annie, that that is a really good question, and that's that's probably our best answer, isn't it? Well, what Tom, you... let me throw something in there real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, the population is growing, but realistically, I don't think there's any way to determine the size because even if you go by witness encounters. For every one witness that comes forward, you're going to have at least 20 or 25 other people that don't. That is true. On yeah. top of that, on top of that, you don't know which people have seen the same Sasquatch or a different one. Right. Here's the important part yeah. of that. You know, you see all these people, and I, I, I basically on Facebook, that find footprints, and it's the it's the trophy moment. Look, I'm important because I found this. Okay, what I'm always saying about documenting tracks, the reason we document tracks and do it in a meticulous manner is so you can get a head count. Because footprints are like fingerprints. They're all individual. And, and the example was, uh, there were a couple of examples. And this is from back, you know, in the Bluff Creek days in the 60s. There was one individual they found footprints of in the Bluff Creek area, and I don't recall what year it was, whether it was 1965 or, or when it was around that time period. But the year, the next year, they found the very same or footprints of the very same individual 150 miles south of there. They were able to identify individual by their footprints. Uh, so if you were able to document the footprints in an area, you'd have a pretty good idea of how many of the creatures were there at, at at a, a given time period. So if they, you could get a good foundation of prints, then that would be a good foundation to start on. It would, absolutely. That'd be your starting point. Whether It wouldn't matter about sightings. The footprints are physical evidence, and that gives you your population numbers. Yep. Well, and some of the footprints are going to be uh, unique. You know, you've mentioned this before, Patty. Well, they're all unique. Yeah, Um as long as you know how to you know, say, hey, this one was like, for example, you said at one point, Patty, Patty's footprints were obviously found in Northern California. But at one point, didn't you say in 1980, she was found up in Southern Oregon? That's what that's what Renee DeHinden told me. Yeah, that was the last time they that that particular Sasquatch's footprints were found were in 1980. Okay, yeah. That's so you good. could so you could have, and I've got a couple of examples in my office here. There are two two fourteen inch tracks, let's say, but you can tell they're two different individuals. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. In, in fact, uh, Annabeth, who we had on a while back, the track she found this past Christmas of twenty twenty two, in Central Texas, not far from Forest. Um, those were 14-inch prints. And when we looked at the video, we thought, oh, it's a juvenile based on her footprints. But when, when our good friend and historian, Alan, went there, he measured the tracks, did a very good job uh, with step and stride and counted the prints, etc. cetera. Uh, we found, discovered that was an adult. Well, that brings up an interesting question, and that is, let's say you do have a juvenile. And let's say you find a, it's obviously, you know, there's, it's undeniable. You find a juvenile, let's say with a 10 inch footprint or even a seven inch. Um, as it grows and the foot gets bigger, and let's say it has a, a very unique footprint, can you, is that, is that uniqueness going to follow it through its lifetime? So it should. That, uh, well, here's okay. the deal it goes along the same lines as human shoes. And people think, well, what do human shoes got to do with Bigfoot footprints and identifying them? Um, you might have the same foot size as someone else, and even in your family. Have you ever tried putting their shoes on and feel just how uncomfortable that shoe is? It's well, because yeah. it's because every person's foot is different. It's like, like I said, it's like fingerprints. They wear differently, 
and the tracks are going to do the same. They're going to show the same differences. Well, and the whorls and your uh, dermal ridges in your foot, and it's the same way with prim all primates. Uh, Jimmy Chilcott, uh, uh, down in uh, uh, one of our Texas uh, law enforcement people here, probably, probably the foremost authority on um, primate um, footprints, handprints, and everything else. And he's not even an anthropologist, um, but he managed to get a study. And every their feet, their hands, their prints are all unique, just like it's unique to us. I mean, you find criminals by their fingerprints, their mm -hmm. footprints, and everything else all the time. It's the same thing with Bigfoot and all primates. That's true. So and like, as like I said, you know, if you were able to, you know, when, when people are finding all these footprints, if they document them properly, and I, in my you know, it's a, it's a shameless plug, but my Bigfoot Fieldwork 101 book, and that's the what Alan used uh, when he went to Annabeth's property. He used the information contained in my book to document those prints correctly. Um, so you, you, you create a baseline with those footprints in identifying the group, individuals, and their behaviors. Well, not only with the prints, you can throw in scars. You could, yeah, if there were scars on the feet, sure. And there were deformed there were deformed tracks that have been found periodically, and one of the most famous ones were the Bosberg tracks from 1970 in eastern Washington, you know, where Renee Hinden and, and Grover Krantz and um, Ivan Marks, they found those prints, and they found more than a 1,000 tracks. Well, Jeff Melton actually uh, had seen there was a, some Bigfoot that had actually had a scar on across the, the base of, uh, I believe it was the heel. Now, I may be wrong on that, but it did have a scar on its foot. And um, somebody had sent him some different tracks, one from British Columbia and then some in the Washington area. And it had, ended up being, um, several of these ended up being the same Sasquatch because uh, of the scar that uh, gave away the footprint. Right, yeah, you you can like I said, there are whatever features each foot's different, so you can identify individuals. Okay, let's move on to the next question, Tom. Okay, so and this is actually where this is sort of um, kind of dovetailing off of the first question, so this is this is kind of interesting. Um, can you gauge? how fast the population is growing what's the velocity of population growth well, that's a good that? question i suppose i mean again if you if you could identify a group in an area and follow them around you might be able to gauge that but i don't know at this point if there's any way to do that what do you guys think maybe juvenile sightings well that would certainly help and the frequency over time, I mean, if you say you've studied an area for 10 years and, you know, you had, you know, juveniles of a certain age or size, you notice that every couple of years there were new ones introduced into a group. Right. That, that might give you an idea, but um, Sasquatches typically don't stay in an area that long to make that kind of determination. Yeah, that'd be kind well, of tricky. Primates in general aren't rapid producers, and no. they don't produce in multiple births. So, uh, I mean, yes, you, every once in a while you'll get that, uh, uh, you know, strange situation where you have, you know, um, multiple births. But uh, let's face it, uh, primates don't produce litters. So um, it's your birth rate is going to be slower. And, and unless you've got somebody that can literally follow a group around, and I don't know of any of us that have decided they're going to volunteer to go do that and uh um i'm waiting will um. well actually <laughs> when i worked the, when i worked southern washington for those dozen years or so uh the group that was at yakult you know there was there was the male that encountered the family there and then when i i was the only one that went there that actually asked to go look to see which direction the sasquatch went None of the other people who claimed to be investigators had any interest in it. So when I did that, I found in a hidden location uh, two different juvenile sets of tracks. One was 12 inches, the other was 9 inches. Uh, and I told the family, I said, keep your eyes open. There's probably a female here, too. And, and sure enough, a month or so later, 
they saw the female one night under the barn light. Um, in fact, they were describing it in, in detail to me over the phone as they were looking at it out the window. It was only about 40 or 50 feet from the house under this light they were it was standing there watching the house and when i got there there were 16 inch tracks in the flower beds so uh but that that group i was able to track with my map you know based on sightings uh around that area for a dozen years and that group never did increase in size or decrease in size it stayed as four individuals for that amount of time well, what I'm referring to is, uh, and, and and I realize what you did there, that, that was great work, but I'm talking about somebody going out and actually being a <clears throat> a Jane Goodall or Diane Fossey. A big <laughs> I don't think you'd be and able I to just, keep up with them. I just them. don't think that, well, I don't either, and the, uh, they, they lead an entirely different type of lifestyle. They so, do, yes. Um, you know, so and you're, they're, you're they're never going to have a situation like that. And you're extremely not, uncooperative. And you're not going to stay hidden from them. To be able to observe them, no, they're going to spot and you. And they're going to be gone. Be, and well, in some, at what point in time do you maybe become lunch too? Well, so, I was know. I was going to come around to that. Yeah, I mean, it's a risky <laughs> business. You might go out there and think you're going to observe them, and the only thing you're going to observe is their stomach lining. But right? <laughs> <laughs> you just maybe never, I could convince them I'm really tough. <laughs> you, you just you never know because you know there's yeah. some that aren't behaving like that but how, are you going to risk it well i'm not <laughs> i mean i always advise, and i don't think you are either i always advise people to be extremely cautious you know because we don't know i mean there's no way of knowing well and i mean and you see some <clears throat> famous anthropologists like um um uh, oh what's his name sarmiento of the um oh god National Science um, Museum, and then uh, Jeff Meldrum. I mean, two very famous anthropologists. I don't see them out there in the field, you nope. know, following them around. Nope. Sure, they'll go out on little expeditions every once in a while, but they're not out there planting themselves in the in the middle of a, a, a forest, you know, waiting or looking. They're just not doing that. It's a it's tough work. I mean, you know, people want to get involved in field work, and then they find out quickly that number one, it's a lot of work. Two, it's very time-consuming, and three, most of it's very boring. Uh, because unless you're right on top, it, it's kind of like Milo. You can relate to combat. You know, it's ninety-nine percent boredom, and then the one percent is sheer terror. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hurry up and wait. Yeah, that's that's a lot of it. I mean, because even if you've got a real active area, and like we do, um, Tom, you know, it's it's hit yeah. or miss. It is. And quite often, uh, you know, we go to areas where they're not and they are, or, uh, you know, we went up to that one area the last day, um, you, you found an 18 inch footprint, mm -hmm. you know, perpendicular to the, uh, truck tracks. Yeah. I mean, it's, you spend a lot of time and resources and most often with very little or no results. So it's, it's extremely difficult and especially, you know, if you're not in, I mean, you can be out there if you're in the best condition and, and like these people that do these survival shows and, um, you better be willing to go, you know, 30, 40 miles on foot in a day if you're going to do something substantive. And then again, you got to get the creatures to cooperate. Well, there's only three things that you have to do. I've said this on the show a couple of times. Number one, if you want to have an encounter, one, you got to go with where they are. It's important. Number two, in order to go where they are, you got to know where they are. Number three, you got to provoke them in some way. Yeah, that's true. Hug a tree. There you go. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, uh, question. This is the third question, and, and I'm, I have real quick. I just want to do a shout out to Annie. This this uh, person we've had her on the show. She's from Australia. Um, she did the best questions that I gotta say that I think I've ever seen. So, uh, for those of you out there that have a question for us, um, she just sent an email and here's one, two, three, four, right on down the line and multiple questions. So if, 
If anybody wants to do that, we love it. If you want to send us 15 questions, that's fantastic. Just, you know, here's and don't, one. And don't think you're the only one, because if you have a question, a right. hundred other people might have the very same question. They do. They do. And so a lot of people, um, whether you're sending us uh, your questions, by the way, uh, you want to send those to questions at creekdevil.com. Uh, I would love it if we got more emails like this, you know, with multiple questions. Uh, but, you know, I, I think about uh, when I've gone to workshops and seminars, I worked in the information services network security for, gosh, 100 years. And you just sit there, everybody would sit there until the instructor would come up and say, I want questions. I don't care how dumb you think it is, because your question is almost certainly one that other people in the room have. And once you got started, you'd discover that that was true. It, they would just come flooding in. So anyway, there you go. So send us, send us your question or questions to questions at creekdevil.com. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move right on into question number three here. And that is, in the USA, is there some sort of a database or a compilation of reported sightings? And I'm going to say, at least for us, the answer is yes, but we haven't published it. What are your thoughts, Will? Well, I, I guess you'd have to address whatever whatever database that would be. Oh, TW's with us. Hey. You want to ask, hey, ask, TW. ask that question again so he can hear it? Yeah, I want to ask TW. Okay, TW, Annie in uh, Queensland, Australia, wants to know, in the USA, is there some sort of a database for a compilation of reported sightings of Bigfoot? <laughs> <laughs> there's several there's several databases, but they're all privately maintained. Nothing's done by the federal government that is public knowledge. Right. Was, and that's... Uh, I was waiting for him to say something. The <laughs> problem is that there's so many different private groups that, that maintain their own databases for sightings that... You know, you don't know which is crossing over into the next. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. that's the whole thing. If there is no, no centralized one. Yeah. There's there's no official one. And, you know, ever... even, even going back to the original pioneers, um, oftentimes they didn't know what each other had because they'd be contacted by people and then they may or may not want to share that information or it would be... Um, you know, repeated stuff for an example is like, um, you know, Green wrote his, his first couple of books and then Rene DeHinden put a book out with, actually he, he helped Don Hunter write it. Um, but it was really the same information that came out in Green's book. Well, so it didn't... Well, 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 I'm interrupting you. I have an emergency. Uh, uh, I have a friend that just got took to the hospital. She's, uh, somebody else is calling me immediately. I okay. need to get a hold of them. Okay. What happened. So I'm sign, I got to sign off. I am so sorry. You can call, call me back and say 10 minutes here, and maybe I can get back on, okay? Okay, no problem. All right, bye. So that, you know, his book didn't do that well because green stuff had already been out, and people looked at it, and I, even I did when I first got a copy from Renee, and I thought, well, you know, it's the same stuff that green put out, the very same story. So, um you know, you get duplicated information, and, and there's also people that put stuff in databases, then they change. If the, if the stories don't conform to their view of whatever an account should be, they'll alter wow. those accounts. So the quality is not always real great. I think Here's a question I have. Well, go ahead, David. A lot of times you'll see these documentaries on TV and they'll say every year there are X number of reported Sasquatch sightings around the country or around the world. Mm -hmm. Where are they getting those numbers from? That's a good question. Exactly. I, I think that's the swag method. <laughs> yep. We all know what the swag method is. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, um, you know. Well, no, and, and that's true, David. That's a, that's a real good point because you hear those numbers and it, 
there's almost an implication that, oh, there is some sort of a clearinghouse or a central database or something like that. And, uh, and really, it's just like what Will just said and what TW said, you know, you don't know when there's cross-pollination between these different, because if somebody reports it to one place, who's to say they have it or are not going to report it to, oh, hey, there's another group. I'm going to tell them about Let's get their opinion. So you're going to almost certainly have some cross, I don't want to say cross-contamination, but cross-pollination. Well, between and TW wasn't different. here when I when I explained, you were talking about footprints before, or in identifying group, you know, size changes and things like that. There's no way of really knowing unless you properly, if you have a, if you had an area that is a focus, an area of focus, let's say, let's say you've got a hundred, just for discussion purposes, you've got a hundred square mile area that you're focusing on over, let's say a 10 year time period. And you get footprints that you're regularly finding in that, within that geographical area. And footprints are like fingerprints. You can identify individuals. So if you were tracking that over that 10-year time period, then you might be able to say, okay, this is what our population size is. And because of maybe the introduction of juveniles or whatever, you could say this is what the growth rate is. Um, and it would follow suit with maybe those, the sightings. And, it, and that's more difficult because, you know, the individuals are there, but how often are they really being seen? So the sighting reports, um, you know, that's kind of hit and miss. But if you've got if you've got that physical evidence documented, then you could make some pronouncements based on that information. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I almost think that sightings are kind of like sightings of, so let's say, a mouse in your home. Yeah. So I have seen that mouse three times. No. Might be three different I've mice. Seen- <laughs> yeah, three different mice, exactly. Yeah. Well, you so, remember when we had Leon, uh, when I first talked to him, he was perplexed because he had the really close encounter with the Sasquatch and his rifle at hand. He said that it was only a few inches from the creature's head. He could have killed it. But um, it withdrew from the brush, and he says, I don't understand because moments later it was like 100 yards up the trail. And I said, that's because there was more than one individual there. And it was like it was like somebody you know physically slapped him in the head because he'd never considered that he thought it was the same individual. There was an attorney here in town who he got out of the Marine Corps. It's a, I, uh, I don't know why his name escapes me, but he uh, he got a job. A buddy of his who is the sheriff up in a little town up in Oregon said, "Hey, well, why don't you come on up here and." Be one of my deputies. Uh, one of my deputies, meaning there was like, you, know, you probably count on one hand how big that uh, department was. But anyway, so he did that. And one day he decided he wanted to go out to the Cascades and he was going to go to an area that these two guys had a mutual friend who had passed away. And I can't remember if this was like a favorite area. But anyway, he was just kind of doing it, uh, memorializing or out of respect for this buddy of his. And he goes up there, and he's been hiking along for, you know, an hour or two, and he gets his compass out, because this is good old days when nobody had a GPS. You actually know what you're doing with a map and compass. But he gets his sighting compass out, and as he's sighting up on this, like, ledge above him, there was someone there looking right back at him, except the someone was huge. The head was enormous. And it wasn't a person. So he's like, oh, man. So he's scrambling for his sidearm. He's trying to grab it. He couldn't get it. So just for a second, he looks down so he can see what he's doing. When he looked back, the head is gone. So he did what a lot of people would not do. And that is he, he went, climbed up that little bluff and hiked another hour looking for this thing. And finally, he gets to an area where he hears a tree crashing on off to his right. And then, well, that's interesting. I guess that can happen. It's kind of unusual. Then he hears another tree crash to his left. And I don't remember his vocalizations or what, but anyway, he hears, he goes, his comment was, I don't know how 
that creature managed to get from my right side, 100 yards or whatever in the in the bush, to my left side without me seeing or hearing it. And I'm watching this interview with him. And I'm like, dude, that's because it didn't do that. You, you ran into a group of them. Um, so anyway, long story short, it's a, it's a Jeff Bowling, I think is his name. You can Google it. It's a very fascinating interview, but he got out of there and by the time he got to his truck, he, they had terrified him with all the noises. It, it really they reminded him me out of, of out of the woods. What's that? They chased him out of the woods. They chased him out of the woods and it reminded me of, we had Gerald on uh, quite a while ago. He had a similar experience up in Washington where, um, they chased him out of the woods, and you know he was, I believe, quite terrified. Yeah, you, you hear this time and again, and, and oftentimes the witness will think, "Well, it was just the one individual," and then they're shocked to discover that, "Hey, there may have been more than one." You know, to to make up for those discrepancies and what they what they were hearing and experiencing. Time and again, you hear that. And time and again, you talk to well, people. I, yeah, go ahead, T.W. Yeah, no, that's. I mean, that was. The, that was the experience that me and that buddy of mine had was that it wasn't one. Uh, there was several in that area uh, because when we got roared at, it was one was right behind us. Uh, but we're looking in this pecan orchard and we counted no less than nine sets of eyes. How many? Nine of them? Nine sets of eyes. Wow. And the alpha was behind him. So there were 10 of them. That is, uh, you know what that is, T.W.? That's, <laughs> that's nine too many. That's an underwear changing moment. That's what that was. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that Touché. was Bruno Lou go by and Haynes, hello. <laughs> Touche. Well played, T.W., well played. He was, and he was texting me while this was going on. <laughs> oh, well, is that... you know, I was okay. I, I, I maintained my bladder and bowel control. Uh, my buddy wasn't quite so lucky. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told him, I said, get that poor Deppie out of there. Go ch- get him changed and cleaned up. Go have a cup of coffee and calm down. You know, it's, and it's like I said, it, there's always those moments where you think, I don't have a big enough gun. Yeah, that's right. You know, I, and that's, and, you know, especially when you're talking about these, these creatures don't travel individually. No. They're not solitary animals. They're very much, in, in my opinion, they're very much uh, uh, troop or pack driven primates. Well, all primates are. They, all primates are. So to, uh, for anybody to think that they're individual, which is what they used to think, that's incorrect thinking. Yeah. They never do anything just by themselves. You may have the occasional one that will creep up into your yard and is uh, looking for food, but don't kid yourself. There's three or four not too far, terribly, terribly far away. Well, so there's there's a guy we're going to have on the show here in the near future, and, and I was talking to him. I interviewed him years ago, and he had a really interesting encounter. Um, and then many things have happened since then. But he was telling me last weekend that on his initial encounter, he, he encountered the one individual, and he said when it ran off, uh, there was a lightning flash, and in that brief flash of lightning, he saw three more that were nearby. So that's a great example of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, in my opinion, you know, you might end up, uh, you might get a deposed alpha that is chased out of the troop. Uh, And that theory kind of floats around. And uh, I can't put any validity or knock it because I just don't have, I don't have any proof to, to say contrary or to support it. That being said, I don't think they're they're 
my opinion is I don't think there's so much that way. You might end up with a deposed alpha and a new alpha takes over, but it's more, it's more along the lines of generational where it, it's a younger, stronger alpha comes up and the older one just kind of has to step down because he just can't, he can't lead the troop like he used to. Yeah, I think if you look at other other primate he, groups, you, you see the same thing in each one. Yeah, they don't they don't they don't expel them from the troop. They just they step down and take a subordinate role. I, I remember I saw a thing on baboons oh, about a year ago, and this the alpha of that particular group was really kind of a, a scumbag, and and none of the other individuals liked that particular baboon. And what happened when they finally got rid of that one as the alpha um, was they, I can't remember if it was a lion or if it was a snake, but they all kind of pretended that the, the approaching predator wasn't there and the alpha wasn't aware of it, and they let it get killed by the predator. <laughs> and so the one that was supposed to take over as the alpha ended up being the alpha, the one that all the rest of them liked. But That was on Serengeti. Yeah, do you remember that episode? Yeah, we talked about that a while back. Right, right. So I think that's that could happen sometimes, but yeah, you're you're right. I mean, it's it's probably a, a different, little different transition. But okay, what do we have for the next question, Tom? Okay, uh, Annie wants to know in general, um, and this kind of goes back to talking about that centralized database or the database amongst different groups. They they all handle it differently, and especially the ones that try to, you know, put their spin or their agenda on it. So in general, is there a willingness for legitimate researchers to share information and findings? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I was waiting for TW there. <laughs> I, I guess in a word that would be no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I, 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 do, do, you, do you want the simple answer? Or do you want the protracted answer, Amy? Uh, my guess is, it, it, look, it, it, it's real simple. And the the quicker we come to terms with this dilemma that we all face, the better off we are and we can move past it. We have so many swollen heads in this field of study. Nobody wants to share anything. Nobody wants to listen to the opposing opinion. Now, when you, you get some way far left field uh, uh, theories, yeah, that tends to not help. Uh, and, and we've kind of joked about some of that stuff. Uh, but the problem is, is when you got somebody like Matt Moneymaker, who absolutely will try to eviscerate any opposing opinion of his. Uh, you know what? I'm sorry, dude. You you need to go. And I think, you're not. And I think that's a problem a with the BFRO website is because that's his creation. Exactly. I mean, there's some really good research groups out there that I know of uh, and that I used to be a part of. Uh, one of them being uh, uh, GBRO, which is or GCBRO, which is Gulf Coast, uh, Gulf Coast Bigfoot Research Organization. Very good group. Uh, when Mary Green had it and she was running it, it was that nobody's opinion was subject to ridicule, unless it was so far out there in left field, uh, like MindSpeak. Uh, it was just, you know, look, we'll, we'll take all, all comers, just, you know, be able to be back up your theory. You know, I've actually, I've actually met some BFRO investigators who I thought were very good. And, and they told me, you know, privately that, um, they didn't really have anywhere else to go. That's why they were where they were. But, you know, I encouraged them to do their own work. So there are some good people out there. Oh, no, they're really great people, really great researchers. Um, a lot of people have problems with Melba K. 
catch him. And she's not, she, she's got some, some far, far fetched theories, but she's not a bad researcher. And she's actually taken that to the next step where she actually has the equipment to do DNA typing, where she can do the genome. Uh, but she's kind of destroyed her credibility yeah. when she claims that she was raped by several Sasquatches. Yeah, well, yeah, that <laughs> didn't help. But, you know, let's face it. Now, Wouldn't Lucy, that hurt? She's, Lucy, she's <laughs> loosey-goosey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I I was in contact with her years ago and, and initially was had offered to help her, but then I, I did some research and, and there were a bunch of red flags, so I backed away from that because, you know, let's face it, in this topic, if you don't have some credibility, you don't really have anything. That's what I was going to say. The whole credibility uh, for, for accounts, so. All right, shall we move on? Yeah, to let's move on. The next? All right. Um, all right, so question number five. And by the way, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. I love the fact that I've got all these questions, and they're, they're numbered. So um, if anybody has a question or multiple questions, either one's fine. But if you have a lot of questions, send them questions at com. Okay, number five, how territorial are they? What area would they cover... And what are the indications? And I just want to say, that's an interesting question because, Will, you mentioned when we were out in the bush doing the research last July, and we found some evidence, and you said, you will not, well, I'll just say it, it was tree breaks. You won't see this in, if it was just a natural occurrence that happened with weather or whatever. You'd expect to see it everywhere, but you only would see it in areas where these creatures are. And, and what did we see? Well, we saw footprints and we saw tree breaks. Well, I, I told the team, I said, now, if this were common, if it were weather-related or whatever the cause was, um, when we went from one area to another it was about a 30 mile drive through the forest up there i said yep. keep your eye i told everybody keep your eyes open tell me how many of these you see so we had people we had you know quite a crew there and we were watching in all different directions and there was nothing in route across right. 30 miles of that area we did find some in the other area we were going to look at and there was a reason we went to look at that area because of sightings and things but uh, you don't see that just anywhere so i guess getting back to the question how territorial are they um, like all primates, they're very territorial, but now those markings are done for different reasons, not just territory, but, um, they are very territorial. Like, and if you go around, you know, like, you know, Chuck, what do you, I mean, you've seen lots of things. Uh, I think they are territory and you know, there's certain spots here in Oklahoma where you have, um, you got some in the northwest, you got some in the northeast, and you definitely got some in the south. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, I just think that they are territorial, and there's, you know, several groups in those areas. TW, you've seen stuff like that too, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that uh, I subscribe to two theories. Uh, one, that they become very territorial if they have – uh, if they have an area that uh, supplies their needs, food, water, shelter, concealment, uh, uh, you'll, you'll and not an not an encroaching other troop. I also subscribe to the theory that they that there are nomadic bands that migrate. <laughs> And do like a big round robin where they come back to a same area every few years. Uh, but when they those those groups, in my opinion, tend to be less territorial and way more submissive. Where they, you know, even if they they feel like they're uh, another group's coming in they're getting out of the area 
they don't want they don't want any confrontation even if they run into humans they really don't want to have a big confrontation uh, but that's just my theory uh, I've, I've ran into some out to a friend's house that you know uh, one got so bent out of shape he got squirted by a water hose uh, he came back within a very short period of time and did a tremendous amount of damage to that individual. Uh, not just to him, but also to his house. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, John was lucky to be alive, in my opinion. Uh, because was, that the, was that the woman that was in the bedroom? Yeah, it, it came oh, into his yeah. bedroom. And that it was standing crazy. over top of him. Uh, and essentially bit off one of his fingers. Um, and uh, when I say it did a tremendous amount of damage to him, that whole hand was casted up, clear down to his elbow. So I, I think, uh, you know, in the process of getting the tar beat out of him and getting that finger bit off, it must have flung him across the room or uh, slammed him to the floor or something because it knocked him out. And when it did that, it went in and started, you know, basically tearing his house up where it did, it did, you know, uh, it was pulling china cabinets down and cupboards down, uh, pissed all over the wall, pissed on the floor. And if you've ever been in an area where a Sasquatch has been, have recently urinated, you smell it. It's rancid. Uh, I mean, it's the strongest urine I think I've ever smelled. It it was more strong than than calorie or horse urine. That's how strong and, it was. And that's, that's what Carol in Missouri told us, you know, where the creatures had marked her car a number of times by urinating on it so they could find her. Yeah. Listen, guys. You know, kind of re- that. Uh, oh, that, that kind of reminds me of. No Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, it it kind of reminds me of going to the zoo and going to the 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 gorilla area. I mean, it, it's it's like the same. Uh, I mean, it's it's rancid like that. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's a common primate oh, that behavior. Miles away. All right, guys. Listen, we're out of time. Uh, Tom, you want to go around the room and get any final thoughts or anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and first thing I want to say is, uh, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to Forrest's friend. I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but she had a friend who had a heart attack, so she had to drop off the line and, you know, go visit her friend at the hospital. So, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, our, our, our hearts go out to that. Um, so, all right, I'm going to start with T.W. T.W., any final thoughts or questions or anything? Remember these initials, folks. F-A-F-O. <laughs> yep. And if you need it in layman's terms, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> pull around and find out. There we go. Pull around. Yeah, right. What else would it be, right? Okay, uh, Chuck. Any thought? Any final thoughts or questions? Always good questions, and um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we bring up is is pretty intriguing, and and it will definitely make you think about things. Yeah, absolutely, David. Any thoughts or final questions or anything? Just a final thought or note on the whole territorial thing when you hear stories from different people around the country and around the world talking about going into certain areas and being chased out of certain areas um yeah i'd say they're pretty territorial when it comes to certain areas that they're in good point all right will uh, i guess you and i are next did we get milo did milo get one? Oh no we didn't get milo milo it's okay, fine. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> now you're in trouble. Yeah, I'm in trouble. Milo, I, 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 here's what, here's my I'm insignificant. I, I understand. I'm, I'm worthy. 
I got, I got, I got a good memory, but it's short. I apologize. It's um, okay. So let's let's hear what what are your final thoughts and questions? Well, I, I like to uh, look up more about that whole thing of uh, when the primates didn't like who their alpha was. They went and tried to boot them out by ooh. We could kill this guy without really knowing that we're really killing him. I like that. That's cool. I thought, that was, I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, it's like, oh, okay. Well, we'll just sit back and kind of, and, kind of ignore the problem. Get <laughs> was that in like, was like Nat Geo or something? Yeah, it was. Would you say it was? It was one of those shows. Okay, I'll go check that out. That was that. That I think we should. The, the Alpha was a real scumbag, so he, he kind of had had coming what happened to him. Yeah, yeah. And there Milo, Milo is a documentary called Serengeti. Okay, thanks, dude. Yep. Yeah, and they followed, that All was right. part of it. They followed a group of baboons around. Wow. Yeah, he was a butthole. He was. <laughs> Sounds like our stuff now, right? <laughs> All right, Tom, what do you have? Any, guys. Tom, you have anything right, final? So, well, I. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but number one, I want to thank everybody for their uh, concerns, kind thoughts um, that they sent through the comments and emails. Um, I really do appreciate it. Uh, and number two, the broken record part is uh, I would love to get more questions uh, from our audience. And I would, I like these multiple questions, but if you have one question, uh, I want to hear it. So uh, you just how do you do that? Well, you send it to questions at freakdevil.com. All right, that's it. All right. Well, listen, I'm going to. Um, I, I think I missed one of the campfire talks because my I think I mentioned earlier. Um, so tomorrow, I'm going to post an additional one that I should have posted a few weeks back. Um, and I, I don't I don't think it's a repeat. It should be a new one. I missed one in the cycle. We if you look on the YouTube channel, there's episode ten is missing. And I think I missed that one because we recorded several. So I'm gonna do that tomorrow. So having said that, thanks for joining us, folks. Join us next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.